Okay. It's so good to be here with you this morning. And let me thank our Secretary Treasurer, and let me thank my brother and friend and President Larry Corn. Let's give him a big round of applause. He, he is so critical in charting a course for a new democracy in this democracy that some think they can buy and steal, and we have to remind them that we are not for sale. I'm glad to be here this morning. Uh, we thank God for his grace and his mercy that allows us to come to this place. I really uh, see myself more as a coach. Uh, I want to bring you greetings on behalf of more than 945 arrestees and thousands upon thousands of people who make up the Forward Together Moral Movement. Would you say this with me? Forward Together. Forward Together. Not one step back. Not one step back. This morning I want to talk about why we must have, I believe, a moral movement across this country. President Cohen, and you're right in this book about building democracy. In his book, Why We Can't Wait, Dr. King said, together, in 1967, we must exert a massive pressure on the government to get jobs for all. Together, we must build a grand alliance. Together, we must merge all people for goodwill. However, it is not some kind of easy coming together. Dr. King said it just might be that the only groups that can form a massive reconstruction of America would be for blacks, poor whites, progressive whites, working class folks, and even recipients of welfare to come together. This, this may be the only coalition that can shift America's economic architecture and make the profound changes necessary to care for all people. That's Dr. King's, that's his prophetic imagination of a just community, what Walter Brueggemann calls prophetic imagination, the kind of imagination that must precede implementation because it gives people the kind of hope necessary to engage the fight. And here we are. A political economist from the University of Maryland recently said in an article, America Beyond Capitalism, what we are really beginning to experience is a process of slow decay punctuated by a reoccurring economic crisis, one in which reforms only achieve sporadic gains, but the long-term trends of growing inequality, economic dislocation, failing dem democratic accountability, deepening poverty, ecological degradation, and greater invasions of liberty, and growing imprisonment, especially among minorities, continues to slowly and quietly change the belief in the capacities and the moral integrity of the overall system and the government governing elite. MIT professor Otto Schwammer, who I had a moment to study with, said there is a blind spot in American economy theory today. It's called conscience. It is the refusal to have an economic theory that looks and sees that we are all integrated and we really do need each other. In light of this, I want to talk about labor rights and civil rights and the moral movement with a southern drawl for a moment. Because I don't think we can just enter this moment in history without stepping back into history. The Sankofo bird in Africa teaches us how to fly forward by looking backwards. Since the early days of the first reconstruction from the mid-1860s through the present day, labor's most difficult challenge has been to organize Southern workers. Because you know work without labor rights is slavery. <clears throat> Remember it was, however, in the late 1800s, the Knights of Labor and other white labor unions reached across the color line in North Carolina. The realities of racism drove them, sometimes reluctantly, always desperately, to fi finally imagine African-American workers as their allies, building on a white-black fusion movement that began with the abolitionist movement uh, that, that, that pushed Reconstruction in the 1868 after the Civil War. This fusion movement, not merely a coalition, but fusion movement, understanding our commonalities and our common future, fought for voting rights, labor rights, educational rights, fair tax policies, 
by 1872, this fusion of blacks and whites controlled every southern legislature in the South, rewrote constitutions, changed the nation. The Knights of Labor moved with this movement, and when they did, the resulting black-white fusion movement won every statewide election in North Carolina and across the South. The fusionists in North Carolina won the governor's mansion, swept the legislature. This black-white fusion alliance focused on civil rights and labor rights and voting rights could have won every organizing drive, and it could have helped the South rise again in a different way. This experiment in interracial democracy was so strong, it could not be stopped at the polls. I'm talking about in the 1800s. Could not be stopped in the new plants during the Industrial Revolution. Could not, it could only be stopped by race-baiting extremists who began a campaign of immoral deconstruction. They developed a movement called the Redemption Movement. And they said this, these, this Redemption Movement, or the Redeemers, as they called themselves, that their goal was to redeem the nation from the influence of black-white fusion. They declared it was their calling. They, the Tea Party, I mean, the, 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 the redemption movement. Excuse me. I'm going to stay in 1800s for a minute. The redemption movement declared it was their calling to take back America. So what did they do? They attacked voting rights. They attacked basic labor rights that were before the labor rights movement, but there was some attempt because even in our constitution, when, when, when black and then white rewrote the constitution in 1868, they put this line in there. We hold it to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and listen, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor. That's 1868 language. But they attacked that. They attacked educational um, rights. They attacked fair tax policies, and they called for tax cuts so they could break the federal bank and then declare there was no money to fund programs to lift the former slaves out of poverty. They sought everywhere to undermine federal protection, and they put conservative extremist judges on the court. They, and then finally, in 1898, they overthrew the government with violence by fraud. They vilified black men as a threat to white womenhood. They deceptively convinced white men in the South that blacks were taking from them. They were funded by plutocrats and an racist oligarchy. And these ex-planters and new corporation owners paid poor white men to put on red shirts and bring their guns to Wilmington. And in daylight, they had a terrorist outbreak on November 10th of 1898 that killed more people per capita than 9-11. And that ended the first reconstruction. Hundreds of blacks and white fusionists were exiled from Wilmington, which, by the way, had the closest port to Africa when blacks and whites were working together to increase wages. Then we have a second reconstruction, 1954. Blacks and whites labor now. Latinos, young people, women, beginning in the South, come together. 1954, the, the Brown case is the beginning, if you will, of a second reconstruction. 1954, Social Security is amended to include farm laborers and domestic workers, because when Social Security was first passed, 50% of white women couldn't get pay in. 1955, the Montgomery Movement. 1961, the sit-in movement, black and white students coming together. 1963, in fact, this week, whites and blacks today, 51 years ago, and labor today were being locked up. 2,500 were locked up on May 4th in Birmingham. 1963, the March on Washington was not just, you know, come by y'all meeting, you know, we are the world. It was a march for jobs and justice. War on poverty, Russell Sage says, talks about the three parts. The first part was designed to boost wages through education and job training. The second was to provide income support. And the third was to bring a system of government health care to the elderly and the poor so we get Medicaid and Medicare. Fusion movement created that. 1964, the Civil Rights Act, fusion movement. 1965, the Voting Rights Act. And then we see the rise again against this kind of fusion coalition, this, this smoothie, if you will. And how do they fight it? With the campaign of immoral deconstruction. Now, this time it's not called the redemption movement. This time it's called the white southern strategy. 
Kevin Phillip develops it. Richard Nixon uses it. Lee Atwater on tape in 1981 after Ronald Reagan had won a landslide victory using the strategy, starting his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, using every code word of the white Southern strategy, Lee Atwater told what was never supposed to be public. Listen to it on Google sometime. This is what he said. And see how eerie it sounds to some of the comparative to the campaigns today. He said, in 1954, you start out saying, N-word, 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 Chris. But by 1968, Chris and I talk about this all the time, Brother Kennedy. You couldn't, he says you couldn't say the N-word because it'll backfire. So you start using code words like forced busing, like states' rights. And then you get very abstract and you talk about cutting taxes, and denying labor rights. Now, it seems like you're talking about economic things, but the byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt worse than whites. You're able to turn whites, in particular in the South and other places, against blacks, and you undermine their ability to work together, and thereby you create a block of states that you can always control and count on. Now, if you understand this history and then look at the attacks we are seeing today, on voting rights and labor and education and fair tax policy, you can see that what we are seeing is a reincarnation with a 21st century twist of the redemption movement of the 1800s, the white southern strategy of the 1900s, and what, but what you also ought to see is if they are fighting that hard against us, it must mean we're in the middle of a third reconstruction. And the forces that are afraid of this kind of future are trying to deconstruct the possibilities. So I think I would suggest to you that the attacks that we are seeing should not be present. We should see them as immoral attacks and they should motivate us to build a national moral and justice movement to save the soul of our people. Our adversaries should not make us go back, they should make us go forward. We must understand the signs of the time. And many times, your enemy is your inspiration. For instance, in the South, the native home of American poverty, where we have more poor people and more political leaders that are utterly untroubled by it than the rest of the land. Ten of the country's poorest 12 states are Southern. Uh, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, the former Confederate states set the gold standard for American economic uh, uh, deprivation. To add in, put in, insult to injury, the Pew Foundation just released a new study of economic stability. They said the states with the lowest economic mobility are Louisiana, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Alabama, Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Texas. And yet, oddly, we're the states most strongly opposed to stimulus funds, to health care reform, to expansion of Medicaid, and to labor rights and most committed to voter suppression. That's nothing more than a reincarnation of the redemption movement and the white southern strategy with the 21st century twist. We are the states that would benefit the most from such program, but maybe they don't want everybody to benefit. Huh? In, and in the, but on the other side of that, in the South, in North Carolina now, 25% of the electorate is black. Mississippi, 33% of the electorate is black. Georgia, 25 to 26% black. Latinos, 3 to 5% in, in many southern states. So if blacks and whites and Latinos get together, if they ever learn the truth about economic reality, if they understand that these plutocrats and the oligarchy that are buying them off are actually hurting them, maybe, as my grandmother said, they will stop cutting off their nose to spite their face and they will come together. The pain, the pain of this movement is an opportunity and understand, you have to understand how I talk because I come from a faith tradition where pain, a cross, can often lead you to a resurrection. Think about where we are 50 years after the war on poverty, even a Republican, Kasich of Ohio, had a brief epiphany of honesty and had to admit that the elements of his party that are, that are against Medicaid expansion are engaged in a war on the poor. If Kasich can admit it, then we must see it. These attacks, say these attacks, say these attacks, these attacks. are the signs, the signs of a campaign of immoral deconstruction trying to undermine a third reconstruction, and we must fight back. 
for the soul of the nation. Representative Ryan recently said in his faulted report that poverty programs give the poor a hammock to lay in. In other words, helping poor people giving minimum wages makes them lazy. Helping poor people with unemployment makes them lazy. Helping poor people with health insurance makes them lazy. Helping poor people with food stamps makes them lazy. In his mind, if you want to help the poor, cut programs. But remember, that's what Lee Atwater said would be the code language because the attempt is to racialize and demonize these programs and to suggest that they're helping the undeserved, i.e. black people, i.e. extremely poor white people, i.e. brown people. We must understand that we are living in a time, a hundred years after a Republican named Teddy Roosevelt declared four moral issues for politics, living wages, minimum wages, health care, protecting the environment, and education. A Republican. So we must understand we, that this Tea Party extremism, they're not Republicans. This, this means Tea Parties and Koch brother extremism is not true Republicans when they attack minimum wage and they attack living wages. We're in a time where corporations are treated like people and people are treated like things. Think about last week. <clears throat> Think about last week how disturbed people got about the Sterling comment. But, but we have to drill deeper because we have an extremist Tea Party operatives with political offices who know enough about Lee Atwater's strategy that they may never use vile language. <laughs> In fact, they may use language that to the seemingly to the untrained ear sounds racially benign. They smile, they give great interviews, they seemingly abide by parliamentary procedures, but underneath the veil and the presence of civility, they promote legislation that attacks voting rights, the poor, LGBT citizens, the immigrant community, and civil rights that are lewd, mean-spirited, and fundamentally contrary to what our democracy is supposed to be about. We live in a time when far-right extremists will do anything to undermine anyone, particularly an elected official that even wants to make some modest gain. They, they did it to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They called him everything. Child of God, they did it to Kennedy, they did it to Johnson, and they even did it to Eisenhower. Never forget that Freddie Koch, that Charles David Koch's daddy, was a part of the John Birch Society when they called for the impeachment of Earl Warren and Eisenhower after the Brown decision. Don't forget this history. Don't forget it. We live in a time when they've claimed he, our president he wasn't born here. He's too small for the presidency. He's the cause of the economic problem that, that, that stemmed from the Bush administration. And now when he exercises the constitutional right of executive orders, for instance, in raising the minimum wage, they claim he's breaking the law, which is a new, which is completes the racist code wording. In other words, he's not born here. He's not an American. He's an outsider. He's a socialist. And on top of that, he's a thug. I'm Paul Pentecost, I know how to discern tongues. <laughs> Do not lay out these attacks for us to be morbid or depressed. In fact, I'm tired of going places where people are just morbid and talking about how bad it is. Let me tell y'all something. If you didn't know, it ain't worse than slavery. <laughs> it's not worse than Jim Crow. It's not worse than the years that women didn't have the right to, to vote. What is bad is not what they are doing. What would be bad is for us not to fight back. That's what would be bad. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Martin King is not going to get back up. Tell him, say, the old labor leaders that died are not going to get back up. But guess what? When anybody challenges our deepest moral principles and our deepest democratic principles, you and I were born for such a time as this. And we must fight back now.
And I'm here to tell you that if we can't fight back now, we don't understand who we are. Anytime, let's unpack, let's, let's really unpack their agenda. Here's their whole agenda. And by the way, if the Fox guy that they send to track me is here, I don't say anything different than I've said anywhere else. So if you're here, God bless you. you know, uh, Hannah that put a guy on me. I just thought I'd tell him that. But, but here's their whole agenda. And we need to stop trying to be so deep, you know, about it. This is their agenda. This is what they're trying to sell to America. And if we can't unpack this, something wrong with us. Here's their whole agenda. You want a great America? Deny public education. Deny health care. Deny living wages. Deny unemployment. Deny LGBT rights. Deny women's rights. Deny labor rights. Deny voter rights. Now, if you really, really want a great America, give those who are greedy and wealthy who want more, more tax cuts. And if you really want a great America, after all of that, give people more guns. I declare I want that debate any day. That's their whole agenda. We got to fight back. But we got to understand something. Frederick Douglass said, those who want freedom and don't want agitation are like those who want the crops without plowing the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and the lightning. He said, power concedes nothing. Without a demand. Never did and never will. And Henry David Thoreau, who wrote the book on civil disobedience, said one time when they asked him, would he repent? of his acts of civil disobedience. He said, if I repent of anything, it is very likely that I will only repent of my good behavior. Because I'm trying to figure out what demons possess me to be so quiet and so good in the face of such wrong. We are in a movement. And we cannot, as, as President Cohen said, compromise with extremists. We must fight extremism. We must fight it, and first way we must fight it was, we must change the public conversation. How does the current extremist public policy line up with our deepest moral values? We must shift the center of gravity. Julian Bond puts it like this, you don't negotiate until you fight. And I'm here to tell you from the ground, not from the ivory tower, not, not from some secret place, not from some talking head, but from the ground, that people, even in the South, are ready for some truth talk. That if we come up with a language that's not about Democrat and Republican, not about red versus blue, not about liberal versus conservative, but a language that destroys the myth, the myth of extremism, that these extreme policies only hurt a few people, i.e. LGBT people, i.e. black, if we start talking about these policies, not just as being bad policies, but as immoral, and we change the terms of the battle, shift the center of gravity, Moral Monday in North Carolina is proof of what can happen. When we decide to build homegrown, indigenously led, state-based, state government, deeply focused, deeply moral, deeply constitutional, anti-racism, anti-poverty, pro-justice, pro-labor, transformative, not transactional, fusion movement coalitions at the state level and nationalized state issues, let me tell you, let me testify. This is the one week, one year anniversary when 17 Forward Together moral protesters were released from jail for having been arrested. We didn't plan for 13 more Mondays, but we knew somehow we had to take the microphone from the extremists, and we had to expose what was going on in the back room and what Governor McCorry, Senate Leader Berger, Tom Tillis, and Budget Director Financier Art Pope was doing. But let me correct one thing, and Larry knows this and Chris knows this. Moral Monday didn't start last year. Don't, 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 don't get that twisted. You don't, it doesn't happen. We've been working together for seven years, building a state-based coalition with over 170 organizations after having started with 16. And we challenge even Democratic leadership, okay, during this time. The Forward Together movement initiated the moral money to dramatize the shameful and extreme public policies and passed by the current leadership. Let me give you a few things and I'll be through. I see a wrap up, it's, it's tough, but I wouldn't want you to miss that. Because if we're gonna change America, we gotta think states. Huh? 
You know what they did in North Carolina, denied 500,000 people Medicaid, 170,000 people unemployment, 900,000 people earned income tax credit, passed the worst voter suppression law we've seen it since, since Jim Crow, took a billion dollars from public education, took $10 million and gave it, uh, to try to give it to private schools rather than public schools. And then, and, 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 and then, but instead of wallowing in despair, the, the, we had done a lot of spade work, a lot of hard work coming together, seeing our issues as, be, as being together. And we decided to challenge them, not with the puny language of left, right, red, blue, but with the framework that these policies are constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible, and economically insane. And so we said, for instance, to the religious right that's often so wrong, that says so much about what God says so little, and so little about what God says so much. You want to have a values discussion? Bring it on, baby. You want to have a moral discussion? Bring it on. Because we know what real morals is. You take your little issues, homosexuality, prayer in the school, and abortion. You claim that's the moral agenda of Jehovah God. You must be out of your mind. First of all, there is no scripture about prayer in the school. Second of all, the four scriptures you use to talk about homosexuality, three of them or four of them you misinterpret, and neither one of, not one of them trumps the spiritual command to love your neighbor as yourself. You want to debate? Bring it on, baby. We know. We know what true morals are. A true, a true moral adjust agenda is establishing justice, loving your neighbor, treating people right, not kicking people when they're down. A true moral agenda is what the Jewish prophet said in Isaiah 10. Woe unto those who pass unjust laws and rob the poor of their rights. You want a constitutional debate? You want a morals discussion? You want a values vote? We say down in North Carolina, bring it on. Three more points and I'm through. That's why now we have more than a thousand pastors and rabbis and imams and Baha'is and Buddhists all coming together saying across the great spectrum of our religion, we agree. That's why we have people who are not necessarily religious, but they agree and believe in a moral society. We must have a moral discussion. I'm here to tell you after 17 were arrested, 945 ended up, more than any time in the history of this country. By the end of the summer, 15,000. Then 10,000 at the first time out of Raleigh. Then nearly 80,000, 100,000 in the dead of winter. And let me tell you one story. We've even been able, Larry, to organize in Mitchell County. Mitchell County is 99% white, 89% Republican. When they first asked me to go, I said, hey. I ain't going up there. But then we went up there anyway, Chris, and when we got there, we found out that those mountain folks have lost their textile job, so they believe in labor rights. They need the unemployment. They have got sickness in the mountain. They believe in voting rights, and they need public education. And we were able to build a coalition. So now in Mitchell County, that's 89% Republican because of the movement, because we didn't talk about Republican and Democrat. The Republican chair renounced the party. They've organized an NAACP branch in that county, never in the history history of the country. It's the most diverse branch in the nation. The only thing is when I went up there, it was at night and about 9.30 after we had our discussion, they said, come on, let's march on the Tea Party legislator's house. I said, wait a minute, white folk. Y'all the one that started that marching at night, but you have a march during the day, we'll be right there with you. I'm here to tell you, we've got an agenda. Here's an agenda that if we can't hook up with this, something wrong with us. Secure pro-labor, anti-poverty, that's a moral agenda. Education equality for everybody, that's a moral agenda. Health care for all and environmental protection, that's a moral agenda. Fairness in the criminal justice system for poor white people and blacks and brown and protecting and expanding voting rights and women's rights and LGBT rights and immigrants' rights and fundamental equal protection under the law. When we build a movement, when we come together across all of these lines, we can change and shift the discussion and the center of gravity. So I conclude with this. Tell the Tea Party extremists and the Koch brother money to go to heaven. <laughs> Just tell them to go to heaven. Because if they wanna know how we're gonna fight, 
they got to go to the great cloud of witnesses of those who died and have already taught us how to fight. We're going to fight like Harriet Tubman taught us how to fight. We're going to fight like Cesar Chavez taught us how to fight. We're going to fight like Rufa taught us how to fight. We're going to fight like MLK taught us how to fight. We're going to fight like A. Philip Randolph taught us how to fight. They taught us to fight together. And if we stand together, we can lift the consciousness of our people to higher ground. Say higher ground. And we can move this nation in a different way. My son is an environmental physicist. And every now and then he tells me about things in the environment. He told me one day, Larry, he said, if you ever get lost in the mountains, he said, Daddy, don't try to hike out of the mountains at the bottom area because snakes live in the valley. He said, make your way up the mountain and then cross the mountain. I said, why? He said, because snakes can't live at high altitude. He says, there's a snake line, and if you get above it, snakes asphyxiate. I stopped by to tell you, there's some snakes in America. There's some folk living low down in America. There's some folk that want to hurt people. It's low down to step on poor people. It's low down to roll back civil rights. It's low down to hurt workers. And somebody got to get above the snake line. And I'm going to tell you what's above the snake line. Love for all people is above the snake line. Fusion coalition is above the snake line. Caring for the least of these is above the snake line. Standing by record, workers is above the snake line. Helping everybody is above the snake line. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that's above the snake line. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run, not get weary. That's above the snake line. Come on, let's take America above the snake line. Reverend Barber will be in this fight together one day longer. Every day stronger. Thank you.